not go back on this. Huh? Uh, ah, because of this. Yeah, sorry. Okay, now it will work. Perfect. Are, are we live now? This is good, okay. Then uh, we can, I guess, get started, uh, I assume. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna have three sessions uh, today. And I guess all of the papers are somewhat related to bioinformatics. So it's a, you're gonna see a good synergy, I guess, between uh, the computer architecture and, and, and a very important, let's say, workload, which is uh, genome analysis and bioinformatics. And we're gonna start with this uh, paper, which is uh, Aligner D. Uh, paper which was published in uh, IEEE JETCAS uh, this year and uh, Maxim is going to present the paper today. He is a, a fifth semester computer science student. He is very interested in computer architecture and especially processing in memory. Luckily, this also is, is this paper is also a bit about uh, mainly about actually processing in memory. So mm -hmm. with that, uh, go ahead, Maxim. Thanks. So hello everyone. Uh, I guess I, so I don't have to introduce the paper anymore. Um, so let's go directly to the outline. Um, uh, yeah, very simple outline actually. So I want to just to like uh, to note uh, the three parts in the aligner D, um, uh, the the archi architecture from this paper that uh, performs uh, DNA short reads alignment. We will see in a minute what it is. So first uh, we'll have a look at uh, the algorithm they use, uh, how they implement it in the architecture, and then some performance analysis. So let perhaps let me first start with uh, an executive summary. So the problem is that um, the existing architectures are not solving DNA alignment efficiently, and this is mainly um, mainly because, like, especially for von Neumann architectures, mainly because of uh, data movements bottleneck. So the goal of the authors was to develop such an architecture that solves this problem efficiently and uh, permits also to enable like new applications. So for this, the key idea, uh, as I said, so the problem was like data movement. So it may sound a good idea to use uh, processing in memory um, to overcome uh, these data movement bottlenecks. And the results are um, uh, 3,500x uh, 3, on, on efficiency compared to a CPU um, and uh, 2 to 4x compared to other PIM architectures, which is like, so the first result is um, not to be considered too, like, too, too important because of course it's a specialized architecture. So you'll get some impressive uh, numbers there. So first let me give you some background on all this information. What is DNA alignment? Why do we need this? or want this. So imagine you start with a genomic sample. This could be from cells. And you know to, you want to know what it is. Like to, you can imagine for purposes of a diagnostic or something like this. So you put this in a machine, which is called a sequencer and you get uh, reads. So reads are small, like, uh, like small strings. We speak uh, of short reads when these uh, strings have a length of uh, 50 to 300, approximately. And, um, but they're kind of unrelated to each other. So they are not ordered or whatsoever. And the question is, uh, how do you go back? How do you know what, what you put in this machine basically? So, so you can formulate this problem like this, where you have a reference sequence is your guess, what is this cell? And uh, you want to find the matches in the sequence for your read. So basically like this, oh, this is off. I think it's some formatting issue, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but the row should be should be in the blue text. So, <laughs> um, so here you can see all the reads we had, and so the output of the like such an algorithm or the problem would be to get the positions uh, of the reads in the reference sequence. Okay. So the applications are like medicine or in research also to understand genomic variations better, uh, and. I can recommend this lecture we had uh, from Chan. Um, also in the seminars, there's much more about this. So now we'll look at uh, different approaches for DNA alignment. So perhaps the, some of you that did the uh, first year here uh, CS 
uh, computer science, uh, remember, we had this problem actually in, in the first year, uh, alignment of strings, and we discussed a dynamic, uh, dynamic programming approach. So this would be like the first one one can think, think of. Uh, but in this case, it would be too costly, like as we'll see. So. Then you have a hash paste. They require a lot of memory, a lot of memory, but can tolerate up to E errors, which is, um, which is good because uh, of uh, genomic mutations, basically. Yeah. And then this is the one that interests us most, burroughs willard transform. Uh, they are very fast for per perfect matches, can be also extended to mismatches. Um, but the problem of all this method, or the problem or like a property of this method is that they, they require a lot, a lot of data movements and very, very few computation per, per memory access. So perhaps if you remember of dynamic programming, it would make sense. Yeah. So that's why it would be probably a good idea to use uh, PIM architectures. And um, so we saw this already a few times in this seminar. So I will be brief on PIM architectures. But just to summarize, the key idea is to use um, the internal security of the memory chip to perform this, all these logical operations. So typically, we'll, we'll perform uh, bulk bitwise operations, uh, but also more complex operations like, like add and so on. Um, the benefits are that uh, when you do uh, computation this way, you can use the internal memory bandwidth. Um, and you don't have to move the data back and forth between a processing unit and, and, and memory unit. And um, you have a high parallelism. And uh, so, yeah, as I said, this reduces uh, data movement. So an example of this would be uh, Embed. So let's just briefly look at what they did here. So here on the left, uh, you have um, uh, the, the, the DRAM structure, classical DRAM structure. So you have three cells. The blue one would be a capacitor, right? And at the bottom of the bit line, you have the sense amplifier. I'm sure all of you know this already. So and it has two ma main mechanisms to compute um, the, the operations. So the first is to compute end and or operation. And we saw this already also. So just as a reminder, uh, and then or in MBIT uses triple row activation. And this overrides the content of these three cells with the majority operation uh, of this between these three cells, which means like if you have two one um, in, in these three cells, then you'll get a one in all of them. You have two zero, you'll get a zero in all of them. So like this, you can compute N and OR, as you can see. So here the value in C was decided and then you get N and OR. And the NOT is much simpler. It's just you take here the result of the sense amplifier. So that's the idea. Of course, you have to put it back in the memory, but um, exactly so. so. Now we can dive in the algorithm of the alignity. So as I told you, uh, it's based on BWT. Uh, so I may perhaps explain that uh, before. So BWT is a, is a transform on a string. So here you have a string that would be like our cell or something like this. So this is the string. The dollar sign is just a, like end of string, so end of line or whatever. Um, and then you have two main operations. So the first is uh, you put them in a table and shift them. So every row is the same sequence, but shifted by one. And then the second operation is to sort them lexicographically. And the BWT, <coughs> sorry, the BWT is uh, the last column, the red one. So that's simple and that's used. Now we'll see for DNA alignment, but also for compression algorithms and that's, that stuff. So before we can align sequences with that, we may want to just, um, I, I wanted to tell you about two properties. So the first one, I'll do it by example. So just look at the, the table here. Uh, if you take a blue and a red letter in the same row, um, the blue letter follows the red one in the original sequence, in the if, uh, reference sequence. So what I mean by that is this. So. This may be obvious like because of it's shifting, so it's rotating and so on. So. And the second one is the what I call first last property. So also by example, here I've circled the second T of each column. So the blue one is the second T of the first column. The red one is the second T of the last column. And these T's correspond to the same T in the reference sequence, which means this, right? You, have, you can have many T's, but we have like the, we know these are the same T. So now we are like ready for, 
for lining sequences with BWT. So we'll go over in, in a small example. Um, so we want to align this uh, reference string with GCT, which is just uh, an example. And typically, we'll start backwards. So we'll start with the T. So this has to do with the property we saw before. But yeah, um, we'll start with the T. And now what we do is we count the Ts between the low and the high index index in the BWT. This means the red column. So these are this one, basically, right? So and now we can index these Ts in the first column, in the blue one, because we know at position low, we saw only one T. And at position high, we saw all the three Ts. So we can index the first to the, from the first to the third T in the first column also because of the first last property. That's what we, we saw before. That's this, right? So then we can continue with the C. So again, we do the same. Now it's in the red column. So now you should, you should know why we are doing it backwards because you know the blue letter follows the red one in the original sequence and so on. So you, got, you get these two, T's, uh, two, two C's, sorry, two C's. And the first one that is circled is the second T of the last column because you have one more in the gray area. Gray area. So now our like low and high pointers that are now here in the second table. Uh, so you can do exactly now the same game and sequence the second and the third C in the first column. And so you can do this for G and then you get your answer, which is three and seven, like the, the index of these sequences. So you can now locate them. So but what you see perhaps is that this computation, what we did now manually, can actually be pre-computed. So I, I just need the information, how many of these letters did I see at each, uh, at each row and where do these, uh, where does this letter start in the first, first column? So this is information we have, we don't need anything for that. And so we can pre-compute that in the marker table. So that's this table. And um, so now our algorithm is very simple actually. So think about that, perhaps that's the thing not to remember. <laughs> it's now our algorithm is I get a character, um, I have low and high index, and I check at these indexes for that character, what is my next index in this table. So this is basically only a memory lookup. But we have one problem. So uh, yeah, uh, the problem is that, actually I can ask, I don't know if the microphone is already around uh, or not. <laughs> Well, what do you think could be the problem, basically? Yeah, or you can speak like this, and I'll, I'll tell. I'll tell in the microphone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So just to repeat, uh, person in the room said the table would be massive, and that's absolutely right. So that's the problem we have, right? So in the paper, they are uh, saying about like forty-five gigabytes. Um. So the solution they propose is to sample the table by D. So, which is a constant. So now in the memory, we don't have all this information. We have only the only every D row, basically. We keep only D row in the memory, every D row. So what we are left in memory is this sample market table, which is divided by D then in size, and the BWT and also the, these indexes. Um, exactly. But now what I told you just before, that the algorithm was very simple now because it was just a memory lookup. It could be right that this, uh, that we didn't sample this row we are interested in. So we don't have this information anymore. And that's a, basically that's a problem and that has a cost. So we'll say this is the, basically the cost of sampling. And so we have to recompute this, this, uh, this information that we lost basically in sampling. And this is up to D operations because we sampled by D. And what we do is uh, exactly the same as before we did manually. So we count the matches with the BWT, That's, that was the first step. And then we add this to the value we still have in the marker table. That's the second step. So for this, we need two operations and that's like the key message of this slide. So these two operation, operations, ignore and add. That would be very important for the for the implementation in the hardware, right? 
So, and to move to the, to the hardware slowly, we also should notice that this pseudocode or this method has two, two phases, basically. The first one is counting. We count the matches with the BWT, as I said before, and the second one is adding this uh, value, this counting value to the one we still have in the sample market table. Okay, so in the hardware, hardware it can look like this. And this is also off, but yeah, <laughs> that's live. Um, and uh, so I get a read and I get the, this BWT in the sample range. I count how many I find, he's one, there's only one A. And then I add this as the, with the value I have in the, in the table. And that gives me the next index. So we now, our job now is to put this in the hardware. So what well, was the job of the authors, but I will present it. So this is a memory array, uh, just to recall. So you have cells and so on. And at the bottom, we will put some add-on circuits. Um, and it looks like this. So you recognize the XNOR and the adder and do two stages, counting stage and adding stage. And basically that, that was it, so that's the architecture. So now they bring some novel gates, what they, what they say, and so we'll also have a look at them. This is the XNOR gate. Um, it differentiates this architecture from other architectures because other didn't have any uh, XNOR gate. So remember, MBIT and OR, you need many cycles to do this XNOR, and it takes only three transistors. And the second one is the other, and um, so if you, if you have a very sharp eye, you may recognize here the XNOR gate uh, and here a multiplexer. So the advantage of this is uh, you can reuse one XNOR gate from before because these two steps are sequential, right? In the pseudocode, they come one after the other. So you can reuse one. And also it takes only 12 transistors, which is like uh, they say in the paper, traditional full adder would be uh, 34. Yeah. So now we'll have a look at the, uh, at the at the performance of this architecture. So just before, like how how they did it, they basically they designed this in software. So and then they simulated it with hundred millions of read alignments on the human genome, which is uh, publicly available. Um, and then they did performance analysis uh, in this case with MATLAB. So. We'll have a look at this. So for the throughput, we are here uh, because the throughput like higher is better. And now a few comments. So here you see this, uh, this, uh, this impressive X compared to a CPU, as I said, is not super representative of the quality of the PIM architecture. Um, then you have approximately two X compared to other PIM architectures. Uh, and this is mainly because this, uh, uh, this align aligner, the architecture is like more specialized than other ones. So it's uh, exactly tailored to this application right? with this XNOR gate, yeah. So, and you perhaps may notice that the FPGA is like as good as MBIT and almost also as uh, Drisa, um, which, which says actually, uh, if you don't have this specialized gate, then it's then your application is as good on an FPGA. So now the power consumption, so we're still here. Lower is better. So we have the best of the, <laughs> the tested one. Um, again, 100x compared to CPU, it's a massive improvement. Um, uh, 2x compared to, to other PIM architectures. And this is gain, uh, this gains is mostly due to less transistors, less, less cycles used and so on. A uh, few comments on the memory wall, because that's why we used PIM in the first place. So you see the PIM architectures uh, don't have off-chip memory, which is kind of a bit of a trivial result because the chip is the memory, so uh, yes. <laughs> so you don't have to move data, data around. That's basically what it's saying. Um, then the memory bottleneck ratio, that's like a measure for how much you wait for the data. And here you see also an improvement because of less data movement, so. And the resource uh, utilization ratio. So PIM is uh, also massively better, better because of higher bandwidth, the 
like the inner bandwidth of the DRAM and the parallelism. Um, you see also that the proposed one is like it's not much better than the other one in this case. It's, it does approximately approximately the same uh, utilization rate, resource uh, ratio. Um, so now we have a small discussion. So first, uh, perhaps I'll begin with the strengths and the weaknesses of the paper that I found at least. So here you may recognize on the left, um, this picture like we had many times, <laughs> I think. Uh, and for me, this paper is a nice, is a nice exa example of this. So it's a nice example of co-design between um, between software and hardware, how you can modify an algorithm to get it in the hardware. And basically you can see like they did some modification on each of these, uh, almost like almost each of these uh, layers. Yeah. So for example, they design new gates that fits the application. And uh, what I liked also in the paper is it covers, it's quite com like complete. So it covers also extensions of the algorithm, mismatches, which are in practice actually very important because you can have many genetic mutations. So you will not get the, exactly the reference sequence perhaps, most probably, I guess. Um, exactly, yeah. So this is not a BWT is like not the most natural way to get these mismatches, but they did some extension. Uh, that I didn't present because I think they're less like less fundamental than the, the um, uh, standard algorithm and its implementation in the hardware. Okay, uh, I like also that they took like they took many many different uh, systems architectures and uh, tested this algorithm um, against it against them. And uh, what was for me a bit of a surprise is they mentioned a very low overhead. In space, so it's only two percent more or uh, more of uh, area uh, in, on the DRAM chip, which they say might like might be useful for manufacturers, for example, because you don't have to like your chip doesn't get too too big. So um, yeah, so for me it was a surprise because they put for each bit line like such a circuit we saw. So uh, I did not expect uh, that uh, such a low overhead. Now we move to the weaknesses. So I told in the right beginning, I told about short reads, like there are between 50 and 300 reads uh, characters. So one can ask, like, what about long reads? So can I use also this architecture, for example, for long reads? And um, so since I wrote something here, I will not ask in the room, but. Uh, so basically the answer, and to be fair, like the authors also mentioned that in the paper, is like, it's not optimal, right? This architecture for long reads. Because essentially you have these two stage, counting stage and adding stage for each character, and they're sequential. So if you have a very long read, you have a lot of these consecu uh, uh, consecutive steps, and you cannot, de you cannot do them in parallel with this algorithm and this uh, architecture. So this might get a, a problem, like because depending on the sequencer you're using, you get you may get long reads and so on. So this cannot really be extended in such a way. I mean, you can you can still do it, but it's perhaps not such uh, as efficient as for for short reads. So then we'll discuss a bit, a bit more this point afterwards. So another thing I noted is there's no mechanism to ensure data privacy. Um, and I guess we're all um, uh, we are all uh, we we are all on, on the how do you say uh, we all think that data that DNA data can, is like sensitive. So, um, so like, is it tolerable to have an architecture that doesn't doesn't take privacy into account for such applications? Um, that would be another weakness that I noted. And on the same, like on the same level, um, how bad could a bit flip be like here? And perhaps I want to ask the audience about that. So what do you think? Uh, what are the consequences? What may be the consequences of a bit flip in an architecture where, where 
where I'm manipulating genomic data and trying to match things. Yes. I can repeat it. Yeah. Considering that the algorithm is very dependent on the positions of the actual genomes, if a bit flip, for example, happened on the index, we could misrepresent where our exact genome starts, for example, or maybe uh, if a bit flip occurred in uh, the readings of the genomes themselves, so maybe the sequence seeked would be modified mm -hmm. and we could get the wrong sequence, which would be useless. So I think that uh, bit flips would definitely be uh, potentially very destructive for the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so exactly. So um, I think just to like to nuance it a bit, uh, I think one bit flip, okay, if it's in the index and if it's in index of the answer, you really have a problem, but uh, only one bit flip on the data can be okay if you use a, an algorithm that takes mismatches into account, right? Because it could be, yeah, as I said, you could you could have basically like a, uh, also genetic mutation or something like this. Yeah. Maybe for, uh, if we could guarantee that the bit flips are very low probability, we could use maybe an algorithm like error correcting codes yeah. or even maybe detection depending on the size of the genome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's also like a doable thing. It's just like uh, you, you don't want that an attacker can really target these uh, bit flips and uh, uh, like then you have perhaps to say an application, perhaps then you have the wrong diagnostic, right? It could be very bad. So, um, but that's perhaps a thing to keep in mind. And I just wanted to say like, um, since they build this uh, architecture with DRAM, like it's an error that is inherent to DRAM. So you cannot really, if you solve this and you solve also Rohammer, so it's like, um, yeah, it's something that isn't, I think uh, it's always a risk in this architecture. I think. Just for these applications, it can be, I think, quite bad. So, so some more here. I ask myself if the, like, if the speed up is sufficient to unlock these new applications. Uh, this wasn't clear for me in the paper, um, because, uh, yeah, if you think again about diagnostic in hospitals, you cannot rate uh, weeks. So this would be another, I think, another nice thing to mention, and also. Um, the last point I have for weaknesses, for me, there were uh, unclarities in some details. So I asked myself, what is the, so this adder is like only 12 transistors and they say it's less, three times less than, than the traditional one. So like I asked myself, what is the trade-off? And they don't speak about this. So for me, it's a bit uh, <laughs> of a magical thing. Then I thought, well, it's nice. Then. <laughs> but, um, in reality, so then uh, actually I asked my mentors, I think I can mention that. And uh, they said that uh, like you can have problems with manufac man manufacturing them because this, uh, the other they propose is not really symmetric. So you don't have a, a NMOS and the PMOS transistor really uh, always uh, one for uh, like one PMOS for one, one NMOS. And um, apparently this could make problem in manufacturing this, those chips. And I think here we see also the problem perhaps of their analysis is that this architecture was simulated. So I don't know if this is like manufacturable. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if, yeah, exactly. So, um, so perhaps that would be also a weakness in the sense or a thing to check. Okay. So let's move to some of these weaknesses perhaps. Uh, some ideas on improvement. So we had this long reads point. So what would be an, an idea to adapt this architecture to long reads? Perhaps there's an idea in the, in the room or I don't know, thoughts or. I think you can go on. Okay. I use, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I guess you could split them up to have short reads, but mm -hmm. then you can still figure out the position. Yeah, exactly. So it's also what I thought of. Um, it does certainly have also downsides, but one can think of 
such a thing. Like it's kind of a multi-core, you could say, where you split your long read. So you would be like CTA, JTC, AAC. You split it in different cores, and you complete you 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 do this alignment algorithm in those cores, and then you have like another core. I don't think it has to be uh, PIM enabled because of the, this last core that uh, assemble these results. So I think like the work for the last core is very low actually, because it's only like, if you know you have matches here and here, you just have to check um, if these are uh, behind one or another to, uh, to see if the entire sequence is also there. Um, but obviously it's so there's a downside. So I don't know if anybody wants to mention um, I I just had a small comment on the merging part. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that we might have an extra core that takes care of this merging, mm -hmm. but then um, this would be this is a good idea. I agree mm -hmm. that this is probably the best way to do it. But there's also a bit of intricacies to consider because uh, we have to check if basically. For let's take for example the second one GTC, we mm -hmm. have to check if before it all all of the genome matches, and that might be a bit uh, uh, it would be a bit difficult to uh, implement the implement the merging is my point. Uh, yeah, so that's true. I, I also think like it's not a trivial thing, but um, like I would say it's still like an easier problem uh, than the one of alignment. That was my point. So, um, any other, uh, perhaps any other uh, weaknesses on, on that, on that idea for that idea? So the point uh, I had perhaps was that um, it's perhaps a, a bit of an obvious point actually, but it increases of course the overhead, the cost, and the complexity. As we said also before, like it's not it's not an easy problem, um, but also think about the data, like the this uh, reference sequence, the, the B, sorry the BWT and the sample marker table should be in all of these cores, probably, and um, so this is a lot of data. So <laughs> I'm not sure it it always suits the the the, the problem, and one could ask I think itself um, one could ask like from what point is this approach efficient or is it uh, like worth it basically? So, because if you have uh, like, I don't know, like thousand uh, long read that is a thousand, thousand uh, from this character long, it's probably not worth it. Like, yeah. But if you have a super long <laughs> string, so perhaps you should uh, say not long reads, but super long reads. So perhaps it's then it's a, a good deal. And so the question would be here to answer, I guess, uh, for which uh, read length is this worth it? And I think it's not a trivial uh, answer. Uh, and also not a trivial question, so it might be perhaps uh, more work here involved. Um, okay, and then uh, yeah, perhaps the, the last point of, the, of these uh, improvements. We talked about pri privacy. So I ask myself, and I'm really, uh, <laughs> I don't know a lot about encryption, so to be fair, <laughs> so, but I ask, I'm, I ask myself, like, is it possible to encrypt all this data just as a first step? And what could be the problem, at least for somebody that does not know a lot about this? Perhaps there's some ideas here also. Mm -hmm. uh, I just had a very small question regarding the gathering of this genomic data. Yep. Is this sent over a network or is this uh, kind of handled privately in a lab or? Uh, I think actually, I think uh, bo both of them could be possible. Right? So is the, the output of the, of the machine, then you do whatever you want with that, I, I guess. But also, I'm not also a specialist, but that would be my, my answer. I think both, both are possible. But this is like a good approach to the privacy problem, I guess. So. Because if the data is transmitted over a network, there's a lot of issues to worry about. 
Mm -hmm. um, you could have attackers that maybe inject bogus encrypted yep. data. Yep. So you would need an algorithm that also protects against uh, uh, basically unforgeable uh, cipher texts. I don't remember the yep. exact term, but uh, you would need an algorithm that supports that and then also be impossible to revert mm -hmm. for a computationally bounded attacker. So I think the, the question is a uh, very layered. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was wor worried, one can say, about um, like non plain text attacks, because this genomic data has four, four different letters. So this is probably if you have some skills, which I don't have <laughs> in this case, but this is probably not so not so hard to to recompute the key and so on, right? If you have on, I think also it was like the idea uh, some of you know uh, from Enigma, right? So if you have the, was I think with the weather or something. So if you know what strings are appearing, what letters, then you don't have that many possibilities. So I thought it's probably a bigger problem than just like say, let's encrypt it. And then we do all that stuff on encrypted data. So, but I found then, so I looked a bit around and I found actually uh, there is DNA encryption. So it's a thing. <laughs> and that would be an example of that. Karifa, uh, I think we say. And uh, it uses, bit position shuffling, so the bit order is somewhat randomized, and AES. And it protects it, but now what could be the problem with uh, bit shuffling on our algorithm? Yeah. I mean, if the bits are shuffled, then we also need to append some sort of information to undo the bit shuffling mm, at yeah. the destination. Um, so that will add extra overhead to our yeah. sent data. Yeah. And also we would need to find a way to safely send the, uh, to safely send the key for the AES so that it may be inverted at yeah. the source, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe that can be done personally uh, through some sort of meeting between whoever is gathering the data and mm -hmm. the scientists, or maybe sent over a network with some more traditional uh, encryption uh, ideas. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, but the basic problem is like uh, we are relying on bit position to compare these strings. So we need another algorithm, basically. Like we need an algorithm that gives privacy by design. So that is design in mind with privacy. And this is also not a very easy problem. But there are attempts. So here, if you're interested, there's a link to a paper. Um, there are attempts. And basically, they rely also on uh, public and private machines that some of the computations are done in, in uh, the private device and then send over a public device that is perhaps more powerful and so on where you can handle this, this data that would be then in a way that it is, like, again, safe and private. Um, which, like, uh, bring me to this approach, which is uh, basically this, but like in a bit of an extreme case is you could compute, compute this on a private device and send only statistical data uh, for the application. For example, uh, did, I, did I get matches? Uh, how, many, how many errors? Uh, and so on. So, but basically this means also it's not perfect, right? This means uh, you have to buy such a device. So, <laughs> so now I close the presentation and uh, I'm open if there's any other questions, perhaps I can take. So with that, I guess I'll close it. Thank you for your attention and uh, have a nice evening.
É. Tem um negócio de melhor. Okay, so um, I guess. Sorry, yeah, uh, Lucas, we can hear you and we can get started. Ah, uh, perfect. Um, yeah, just wanted to like, uh, yeah, introduce our next speaker, like with Nils Niedervisa. He's also a fifth semester uh, bachelor student in computer science. Um, his main interest is in computer architecture. and computer graphics and today he will talk about an agent-based simulation platform called biodynamo so Nils, um, the stage is yours thanks so today i will present this paper called high performance and, and scalable agent-based simulations with biodynamo let's start with an executive summary um, the paper presents a library uh, called biodynamo which they developed. This uh, library is for simulating agent-based modeling, which is a modeling technique uh, used in var various research um, uh, areas. The paper identifies major bottlenecks in agent-based modeling and tries to fix them uh, by optimizing its performance. This in turn results in a better library compared to the competition that's out there and allows faster research to be done. And also uh, to simulate uh, bigger uh, problems. So let's go over the outline. At first we had our summary, then uh, we will look at what agent-based modeling is concretely. After that, we will look at Biodynamo's main goals. We will look at the memory optimizations done by the library. Then we will look at the parallel optimizations done by the library. At the end, we will look at benchmarks uh, from the library, uh, an analysis of the paper, and a discussion at the end. So let's first imagine we want to model a pandemic. How will we do that? We would uh, represent the person with, for example, a point. In this case, the red point in the middle could be an infected person and the other ones could be uh, not infected persons. And then this uh, infected person can infect the neighbors. Uh, and with this, we can basically model a pandemic. That's a simplified example of, of what an agent-based model is. You have an agent that has variables. Uh, in this case, it could be like how fast it infects other persons and the behavior would be to infect other uh, agents or persons in this example. The behaviors uh, only work with local interactions with the neighbors. So a person can only infect the person next to it. It can't infect the person very far from it. And it's also usually done with simple operations. Uh, such a modeling technique is very flexible. You can model quite a lot of things uh, with uh, agent-based modeling. And by simulating these uh, simple operations on the small scale, we can get a complex uh, behavior on the large scale. This is a phenomenon called emergent behavior, which can also be observed in nature with an ant colony, for example. Agent-based models are usually developed iteratively. 
That means you start with an initial model with some parameters, and then you try to fit these parameters to uh, an observed data to get an accurate model. For this, you have to simulate the model multiple times, so performance is critical. The performance limits the size of the simulation you can do and also the accuracy. Agent-based modeling is often used for epidemiology. Here we can see a visualization of such a model. I won't go into the details from this, but in this case, a, an agent is a person, for example, that can infect other agents and might also die or something. Uh, it can also be used for neuroscience, uh, where you can simulate the growth of a neuron. And it is also often used for oncology, that's the study of cancer, uh, where an agent is a cell and cancer cells might duplicate or uh, kill others or suppress other cells. But it can also be used for many more uh, research areas. So that was just a um, short uh, collection of them. With that out of the way, let's go over the main goal of Biodynamo. If we uh, compare uh, libraries that are out there for agent-based modeling, there is not a big focus on performance. And this in turn limits the research capabilities of researchers and leads to slower research. So the main goal is to increase the performance. This is done by looking at the memory optimizations that can be done and also the parallel optimizations. We will start with the memory optimizations. Here we can see a benchmark day done where after um, all optimizations uh, are enabled and we can still see a big uh, memory bound on the right. Um, for the x-axis we can see uh, five different simulation techniques and for the y-axis we see the percentage um, at what the microarchitecture is bound by. And we can still see the heavy memory bound that's the for the pink dotted part in the graph, which is around 35%. So it is really important to look at the memory. Uh, yeah. And behaviors uh, needs the neighbors. So we try to uh, decrease the memory distance. So we have high cache locality. Uh, so with that out of the way, let's look at non-uniform memory access domains. These are abbreviated as NUMA domains. Uh, these are relevant if you have multiple CPUs in a system. Like in this example on the right, we have two CPUs and they each have access to a DRAM module. So the total memory is segmented. And we have different access time depending on where we are uh, on the CPU. So the CPU on the left has fast access time to its DRAM, but slow access time to the uh, DRAM of the CPU next to it. So our goal is to minimize access to other NUMA domains. For this, the paper explains how they uh, implement NUMA aware iterations. Here we see a picture that represents that. We first make sure that the agents are partitions among the NUMA domains, and then we uh, partition them into blocks from the same NUMA domain, which can be seen at point two. Then for point three, we partition the blocks among the threads. And then for point four, we can see um, if a thread has finished its blocks, it can start uh, the process of another block 
that isn't assigned to it, as long as it's in the same NUMA domain. But if uh, every uh, block in the same NUMA domain has been already processed, uh, like for 0.5, we can also steal blocks from other NUMA domains. So this was uh, one part of the memory optimizations. The paper has more of them, but I will only show this one. Uh, same goes for parallel optimizations, but we will look at some part of it now. Parallelization is really important. Uh, nowadays, we know from Amda's law, uh, the predicted speed up of a program is heavily dependent on the serial part. So if we only have uh, half of the program that can be parallelized. We can only get the maximum speed up of two, but as we can see, the higher the parallel portion, the higher the maximal speed up. Uh, one can debate whether Moore's law still applies uh, today, but it is definitely dead for single cores. If we look at the development of processes, we can clearly see uh, that the trend for faster single cores uh, doesn't go up, but uh, we increase the amount of cores heavily. So parallelization is really important for the future. So let's look at uh, one part of the simulation that's really important, that's indexing agents. We want fast access to the neighbors so we build an index. And the paper analyzes three methods called KD trees, OCT trees, and uniform grid. I won't go into details what, what of these are, only the best one afterwards. Here we can see a benchmark that they ran. On the x-axis, we again have the five different simulation techniques. And on the y-axis, we see the speed up compared to KD3. We can clearly see that KD3 and OCT trees perform much worse than the uniform grid. This is mainly because the build time is zero, so it can't be parallelized. Uniform grid performs the best, and this is also mainly because uh, the building can be parallelized. Uh, uniform grids need more memory, though, than the other two methods, but the paper measured it to be, at the worst case, only 11%, so it isn't too relevant. So let's look at how a uniform grid works. A uniform grid exploits the fact that we know the interaction radius of agents beforehand. So we know that the agent can only uh, interact with another agent at a certain distance. And so we can build a grid that has the box size of these in this interaction radius. Then we can store each agent in the same box in an array-based linked list and store this uh, linked list in a flattened array like uh, presented with the errors here on the right uh, with the standard uh, 2D array ordering. And then we can rearrange the agents in the memory based on this ordering. This way, the neighboring search is really easy because we only have to consider the grids next to the agent. But the memory distance to other neighbor, neighboring neighbors can get quite big. For example, if you go to the left or right in this ordering, you can see the memory distance is really short because we go in that direction. But if you try to uh, get a neighbor from above or below yourself, uh, the memory distance is dependent on the size of the simulation which can increase uh, very big. We will look at this during the discussion again on how we could order these grid elements to keep, uh, keep neighbors closer together in the memory. With that out of the way, let's look at some benchmarks. Here we can see the same microtecture 
microarchitecture uh, benchmark we've already seen again, and also uh, runtime analysis with again the five simulation techniques on the bottom. And for the y axis, we see the relative runtime. We clearly see that the agent operations uh, take the longest time. That's the green part in the runtime diagram. This is also expected, though, because the rest only really supports the agent operations, and the agent operations are the ones that do the calculations. And we can also see that the uniform grid takes a long time. That's um, called environment update in this case. That's the uh, orange part in the runtime diagram. We can also see for the microarchitecture that the uh, simulation is still very memory bound, uh, but the 35% is quite good for agent-based modeling. Uh, now let's compare uh, Biodynamo with Biocellion. Biocellion is also a simulation engine for agent-based modeling. And it is close to us, though, so the comparison was limited that the paper could do. The paper did do an, ana an analysis, though. Here we can see uh, benchmarks uh, for the right uh, simulation, we have a much weaker system than for the left. You can see the left has way more memory and also way more threads. And in this graph, the biocellion part actually is not there. I don't know why, but yeah. We can clearly see that memory improvements do a lot. And also that biocellion is much worse compared to uh, biodynamo. We can see on the right, we have a, about 5x improvement. Uh, and on the left, which isn't shown, we, we get a 9x improvement compared to uh, biocellion. The testing was limited though, as uh, biocellion is, uh, as I said, closed source. With that out of the way, let's get to the analysis of the paper. We start with the paper strengths. Uh, the paper tackles a critical problem that is used in various research areas. So it does something to the society and it is really uh, amazing how much more performance we can get out of uh, it we see with uh, the comparison to Biocellion. They also did uh, some comparisons to uh, agent-based modeling uh, software that is single-threaded. There you get about uh, hundreds to 1,000 X improvements, which is obvious because multi-threading is key nowadays. We get big performance improvements to other libraries. And uh, what's really nice, I think, is also that the library is completely open source. So uh, we can use the library and develop it uh, to a better library and also use the techniques used in the library for uh, other software. For the paper weaknesses, uh, we have that the paper focuses really hard on CPU execution. Uh, they mentioned that uh, for the GPU, they, it can be used for force calculations, but uh, nothing more. And I think that's uh, really um, sad that they only focus on CPU execution. They do mention the GPU, but don't go into detail, really. They haven't done any tests on that. And also, they don't think about, for example, processing memory or... Uh, uh, hardware accelerator. Uh, we will also look at that during the discussion. And the paper also has a big focus on benchmarks. I think about half of the paper is just benchmarks. Uh, but even with that, it's the comparison to other li libraries is limited. 
this is also because uh, there is no benchmark suit for agent-based modeling. Uh, yeah, and some of the other ones are closed source, closed source, which limits the testing capabilities. So with that finished, I think we will get to our discussion. So for the discussion, uh, the question, the first question is how we can flatten this two-day grid to an array and keep the close agents also close in memory. So essentially, uh, how we can rearrange these arrows to have a better uh, cache locality. Has no one an idea? Maybe just an idea could also help. Yeah. Uh, maybe someone or one could encode the spaces where no. Uh, agents are in at uh, the spaces when I'm um, I guess I didn't really explain it correctly then at uh, the spaces without agents aren't uh, like stored it's just you do this arrangement and then you arrange the agents in the memory according to this arrangement so you the the empty spaces don't matter in this case Maybe uh, someone could think about fractals. I guess no one has an idea, then I will just go on. Uh, the solution from the paper is to use space filling curves. These are types of fractals that uh, fill uh, space. Uh, on the bottom left, we can see um, a Morton order that's uh, basically a set pattern. And on the right, we can see how a Hilbert curve works. These are uh, two uh, space filling curves that the paper uh, tests and compare, but they find that the performance difference is neglig negligible. Uh, but the Morton order is computationally comp uh, easier, so uh, they decided to use uh, that one. So for our second question, what kind of hardware, existing or not, could be utilized for faster agent-based modeling? Well, as you already mentioned, you could use GPUs. Yeah, GPUs uh, would certainly be a good idea. Anyone else has an idea? So for simple like, uh, operations like infecting neighboring agents, maybe uh, in-memory processing or PIM could be used. Yeah, that was, also, that was also my idea. Uh, so I actually prepared this one. So for GPU, uh, can you think about pros and cons? Uh, what would be the advantages and disadvantages? I guess no comment. So for the GPU, I thought that uh, the pros are clearly the high parallelization. Uh, with a CPU, you have an order of tens or hundreds of cores, but the GPU can do much more in parallel. Uh, and for the cons, uh, yeah, and yeah, it's already used. Uh, for the cons, uh, the paper also talks about this. It's that GPUs usually have low memory compared to what uh, CPUs have. Uh, 
and memory is really important for agent-based modeling and you need a lot of it. Uh, and it's also could be hard to uh, request the users to write CUDA code. I don't know how many of you uh, already written like GPU code already, but uh, usually it's not some, something you learn in simple computer science. I mean, for visual computing, for example, we write uh, shader code, but that's, I think, it for, from my study. So for process in memory, uh, do you have any idea what the pros and cons would be? Okay, so I guess uh, the pros would be that you have a uh, faster memory access time, uh, but for the cons, you I don't know too much about process in memory, but I think it could be um, hard to program then, ex especially if you suggest a, a user using your library to uh, write special a special program for that. And the agent operations might also be too complex. Uh, I don't know if that's applicable to all simulations, but yeah. One could also think about uh, hardware accelerators for agent-based modeling, but uh, the paper doesn't go into detail about this. So it's also hard to know what the advantages would be. So yeah, that was my presentation. If you have any questions, you can ask them now. Otherwise, thank you for listening. So uh, we have one more talk, but we may go a bit uh, beyond 6 p.m. Uh, we already reserve another room. Uh, we will, let's have a break, like 10 minute break, and we will move to another room and continue with the third presentation. Uh, 3.1, I mean, the, the, the one at the site.
Hello, hello. Okay. That's awfully bad, but I will have to do it. Now, what else? Can you check what we have in chat? We should have a message from Lucas. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Or we have left. Yeah, yeah. It is already. Only this. Ah, yeah. Sorry. When we start. Yes, sir. We will start. No, no, no. We don't need this. We don't need this. Three minutes. Three minutes. Will introduce you based on the comprehensive text. That's great. Sounds like you're full of things, and otherwise, good. We start with 22, let's read at 32. Everything looks good. Yes. Yeah, I need to get my microphone, I guess. So our next presenter is Severin right here. Um, he's a seventh semester uh, computer science bachelor student. He's generally interested in bioinformatics and he's going to present a very interesting paper, WF ASIC, another good example of further software code design. Go ahead, good luck. Okay, hi everyone. Today I'll be talking about WF ASIC, a high performance ASIC accelerator for DNA sequence alignment on a RISC V system on a chip. To give you a quick outline, I'll give you some background on the technologies that are being talked about. I'll give you a quick executive summary of what this paper is all about. I'll talk about the WF ASIC, the product itself, the algorithm they implemented the ASIC they themselves designed themselves, as well as the system on the chip as a whole. Then I'll give you some of the results of the paper, talk about the strengths and weaknesses I found, and we're gonna end the talk with a little discussion. So for the background, I'll be giving you a quick rundown on the parts of genome analysis that are relevant to the this paper. So, Genome analysis generally starts with a genomic sample that is sequenced in a sequencing machine, as you see here, which produces reads of different lengths. These reads will then be mapped generally to a reference genome, which then shows us the different genomic variants that are inside all of us. I'll talk quickly about the indexing part, as well as the sequence alignment. Sequence alignment is what this paper mainly concerns itself with. I'll be skipping over the pre-alignment filtering as this is just an optimization step that is not crucial to the workings of the whole process. 
So indexing and seeding or seeding. Uh, as we've seen in the first talk, generally when we have a reference sequence, we get several smaller reads that we try to somehow line up with this whole reference sequence. Uh, in this example, we have this little read here where if we compare the first two bases, we see we have a possible match here and another possible match with this second short read there. Next, in the sequence alignment step, we try to match up these short reads to exact positions in the reference sequence, as well as find potential errors that are in these short reads. So for a given re reference sequence and these are the reads, here we have the first one you see as an exact match. And the second one, we mapped to this sequence here, and we found that there has been an insertion of a T base, which might indicate a disease, but could also just be what difference between blonde and brown hair. Now to the executive summary. The problem that this paper is trying to solve is that current read mapping technology cannot keep up with sequencing technology. So these sequencing machines, these third generation machines, now produce reads of lengths of up to 10,000 base pairs. This is much too long for current technologies that are performing read mapping, or technology that can do this is way too large and power intensive, which prohibits large scale adoption, which can be crucial for modern medicine. <clears throat> the goal of the paper is basically to solve this problem. They want to create a small and portable machine that can work with large DNA fragments with these large reads efficiently. The key contributions given by the paper are that they produced the very first uh, ASIC accelerator that integrates the wavefront alignment algorithm that is integrated in a RISC-V system on the chip. The key results uh, showed in this paper are that their product, WF-ASIC, is able to perform read alignment on extremely long base pairs. So you see 10 10,000 bases long with an error rate of up to 1,000 errors. Their product also outperforms every other current technology on the market based on its size to performance ratio. Now to the WFASIC itself and the algorithm they have implemented. First, I'll give you a quick explanation of some of the technology that's been talked about in this paper, so you know what I'll be talking about later. So the Wavefront Alignment Algorithm, which is name giving for their product. It is a read alignment algorithm that is based on previous work. Uh, it implements a dynamic programming approach, but as opposed to other previous dynamic programming solutions, it is able to compute the cells much more efficiently, or it's able to perform a smart calculation of the cells, which allows it to align these extremely long base pairs. The ASIC itself, is a very small, portable, and efficient integrated circuit that is expandable and is able to calculate these extremely long, extremely long base pairs uh, very quickly. It consists of a small Linux-capable RISC-V CPU uh, that controls the ASIC and the ASIC itself. That is the product, the design of the authors. Now the algorithm. I won't go too deep into this as it is a very complicated algorithm, but I'll try to give you a quick overview. So many of you might know the standard dynamic programming approach of string alignment, as talked about in the first talk today. Normal dynamic programming algorithms have to fill out this whole matrix you see here with error values associated with the current index stored in every cell. The diagonal paths represent mismatches between the two sequences. Horizontal and vertical paths indicate either deletions or insertions in the sequence that is being referenced. Right here, you only see the M vector or the M matrix represented. In the actual implementation, there are three matrices, but here only the M vector slash matrix is represented for clarity. You'll see later I, I'm talking about vectors and those matrices. 
As I said, each cell or each index stores its associated error value. But the thing that differentiates the wavefront alignment algorithm from other dynamic programming approaches is that it only calculates the cells that you see covered here instead of the whole matrix. It accomplishes this by flipping the concept around. Instead of storing error values at an index, it stores the longest possible position for a substring for each error value. It does so by not computing matrices, but single vectors, as you see here. Uh, you also see not only the M vectors, but I and T. Again, these are additional vectors that store insertion and deletion information, but for clarity, they have been omitted in the rest of the illustration. Here is a quick illustration of the data dependencies when trying to calculate the next wavefront vector. If you know something about dynamic programming, you know that generally the information for a new cell comes from previous cells somewhere in the matrix. In this case, the information comes from previously calculated vectors. So if you want to try to calculate the new vector, uh, the M vector is generally the vector where the main part of the information is stored. This information comes either from a previous M vector or from insertion deletion vectors stored at the same error value. For these insertion and deletion vectors, data comes from either a previous mismatch vector, M vector, if it is a new insertion gap that is being opened, or a previous insertion vector if it is an existing insertion gap that is being extended. The same for the deletion vector, either from a previous mismatch vector if it's a new deletion, or from a previous D vector if it's a deletion gap that is being extended. Now to the ASIC itself. Here you see an overview of the whole system on a chip. You see the ASIC and the CPU in its own kind of package, as well as two very important components, the AXI light and AXI full crossbar. The AXI light crossbar is being used by the CPU to communicate with the ASIC, uh, as well as to communicate with main memory. And the AXI full crossbar allows the ASIC access to off-chip main memory. Now we're going to take a deeper look into the ASIC itself. The ASIC consists of many different submodules. Firstly, the input FIFO, first in, first out, simple queue, that collects data via the AXI full bus from main memory and sends it on to the extractor. The extractor collects the data and formats in a way so that it can be later used by the aligners. The aligners are basically the main part, the main module. They perform the wavefront alignment algorithm on the given sequences. From the aligners, we get two collectors, BT and NBT. This stands for backtrace and no backtrace. They either append backtrace data, which enables the CPU to later perform a whole backtrace and reconstruct the error data, or no backtrace, which omits that part of the data, which can be important for testing other different applications where backtrace does not need to be performed. From the collectors, this data is sent to the output FIFO, again, a simple queue that just sends the data in the correct format back to main memory. Now, we are going to take a deeper look at the aligners. Uh, as I said before, they're one of the most important modules because they perform the brunt of the work. Um, the design of the ASIC allows for a variable number of aligner modules, which basically makes it more powerful. Each one of these aligners also can contain multiple parallel sections. Inside of these parallel sections, you can see the extend and compute some modules as well as the RAM. This is where the wavefront calculations are performed. Yes, as I said, the aligner is what performs the wavefront alignment algorithm. And as you can see how all these extend, compute, and wavefront modules are interconnected, it allows for an extremely high level of parallelism. Now, for the last part of the ASIC or, or the 
basic itself, we're going to talk a bit about the Wavefront RAM. You see here an illustration of the different uh, error vectors. Again, only the M vectors are shown for clarity, but it's analogous for all the different, for the I and T vectors. This is about the most complicated part of the ASIC to understand, but the main principle is these are the error vectors currently in memory that we need to compute the next error vector. We only need them for some scores uh, based on how the error stores are assigned. Uh, you see here the values in the matrix on the left are the coordinates. So you can kind of cross-reference it, cross-reference the cells with their location in the RAM on the right side of the illustration. Yeah, so the dynamic programming algorithm only needs to look backwards a few steps, as you saw in this illustration before. So this is why we only need uh, these few error vectors in RAM. Uh, one interesting part about that is you see how these uh, columns are ordered, are colored. All the cells in a single column colored the same can be uh, calculated in parallel. This is why they are arranged in a way in RAM where each cell of the same column of the same color that needs to be accessed at the same time is in a different RAM bank, which allows for simultaneous access for all of them. Now for the last part of the ASIC, the system on the chip as a whole, we talked about most of this before. Now we're going to concentrate on the CPU a bit. It is generally a very basic CPU uh, and off the shelf components. They did not design the CPU themselves. One interesting part about that is it has, a, as you see, a SIMD functionality. SIMD stands for single instruction, multiple data, which allows for simple instructions to be executed on a large amount of data at once. This allows for efficient calculations of backtrace when it gets backtrace data from the ASIC. So yeah, as I said, it contains a small Linux capable CPU and the CPU is what controls the ASIC by writing to start and stop registers, as well as reading from a success register and then tells the ASIC to send the data back to memory or do something else with it. Yeah, and again, the CPU is the part that performs the backtrace as they have not managed to implement it efficiently on the ASIC itself. Uh, up until now, do you have any questions about the ASIC or the algorithm? If not, I'll continue with the results. Uh, one important part to mention about the results all these measurements have been done on their specific implementation of the ASIC. So they have one aligner module with 64 parallel sections. They decided to do this because of their own design constraints. They gave themselves these constraints and designed the whole ASIC inside of them. But as I said, for different products, it is possible to extend the design much more. Uh, here you see uh, performance results. Quick explanation, uh, all these input sets describe the length of the reads, so 100, 1,000, 10,000 base pairs long, as well as the error rate, 5% and 10%. The CPU they use in these performance tests is the same CPU that is integrated on the ASIC. And CPU scalar and CPU vector simply means that for CPU scalar, they disabled the SIMD functionality. And for the CPU vector parts, they enabled that. So you can see a slight speed up there. <laughs> Again, they tested with backtrace, the red bar, and without backtrace, they performed both these tests because backtrace generates a huge amount of data. So if they add the backtrace, the uh, process is mostly memory bound, as well as slightly CPU bound, as the CPU is what performs the backtrace operations. So to trust test, test the AC itself, the wavefront calculations, they omitted the backtrace part for, yeah, for one part of the testing. From this, you can see there's a huge speed up using the accelerator 
up to 1,076 times without using backtrace and still 344 times using backtrace. To normalize this data a bit, they also didn't measure time, but uh, CPU cycles to make it better comparable to different CPUs that their implementation, their wavefront implementation could run on. They also plotted the speed up against a number of liners, uh, again, with their six different input sets. And here you can see how much uh, each input set profits from rising number of aligners. We can see that for very short reads, the overhead of using more aligners dominates. So there's very little speed up, but for these very long and high error rate reads, the speed up is basically proportional. So from that we gather that there is a point of diminishing return for the number of aligners. And the shorter the read, the earlier this point is reached, but for these very big uh, reads, it is still very much profitable to use more aligners. The last results I want to show you are the differences between other current technology and their implementation. You can see the GACT ASIC, which is the current front runner nowadays. Um, or maybe I have to explain GCUPS stands for Gigacell Updates Per Second, which is a standard way of measurement for dynamic programming algorithms. You can also see how GCUPS per millimeter is calculated, so performance for silicone area. Uh, you can see that even though the current front runner as in absolute numbers is way ahead of different technologies, due to its rather large size, its performance to area is not the best compared, or still very good, but not the best compared to the ASIC. You see in absolute numbers, the ASIC lags a bit behind just because it is so small. Again, this is their specific implementation of just one aligner and 64 parallel sections, but still compared to its size, it outperforms every other current technology. Uh, the other entries, WFA, CPU, and GPU are just some reference values. I do not believe that these are actually used in production. Yeah, so from that we gather that in absolute numbers, it is still competitive, not against the current front runner, but against other implementations, but based on its area to performance ratio, it outperforms every other technology with backtrace enabled and disabled both, you can see. Yeah. To conclude again, we saw there is current technology that can perform these long reads, but it is way bigger. We saw the GACT ASIC. It is way bigger and too power intensive. And they did manage to create this small and portable system it is way smaller, as you saw, only 1.6 square millimeters big. And it is able to work extremely efficiently on these extremely long DNA reads. Again, the key contribution is that they implemented this the very first AC accelerator. And you saw how their product excels at these extremely long reads and outperforms every other technology. Now I'm going to talk about a few strengths and weaknesses that I personally found about this paper. For the strengths, I found that they had a very strong evaluation methodology. So the way they tested the performance of their ASIC, they were able to isolate different parts as they did with the collector NBT and BT. They implemented functionality that allows them to test very specific parts of the ASIC. They also tried to um, test or use fair testing parameters. So they calculated not time taken for specific tasks, but counted CPU cycles, which allows them to better compare their implementation to differently abled CPUs. Uh, there's also a very high novelty in this paper. As I said, it's the very first ASIC accelerator implementing <coughs> Sorry about that implementing the wavefront alignment algorithm. And I believe they had a very clear set goal. So they talked about what they wanted to do and they went straight for it. They implemented their algorithm and, or not their algorithm, they implemented an algorithm and 
very clearly shows their product. Now, I find a few weaknesses. Um, for one, I am unsure how the parallelism is handled in the paper. So they talked about how you're able to have multiple aligners with multiple parallel sections. And I think that dynamic programming algorithms should generally be calculated consecutively. So if you try to calculate the cell too early, there are, aren't any values to base that calculation on. And I am unsure how they're handling this parallelism. It is not really being thought about in this paper. They also don't talk about what happens above a 10% error rate if they just abort the calculations or something. And they also don't really talk about what happens with reads longer than 10,000 base pairs. Yes, uh, now that I've finished that, uh, we would start with a discussion if there aren't any questions right now. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the goals for the paper was to um, to find a small and portable system. Mm -hmm. And they compared it to the GACT ASIC, which has a much higher number of GC or G cups, mm -hmm. I think. Um, or no, it has a much lower number of G cups. Um, but it's much smaller. And um, like, how do they justify to have a much smaller number and then say it it is small and portable and is able to to work with large data fragments efficiently? Um, I'll quickly go back to that. Um, so generally, yes, the absolute numbers are rather low. But you can still see, compared to a uh, standard wavefront algorithm implementation on a current CPU, so an AMD CPU, Epic CPU is an extremely powerful CPU. And it still outperforms or about competes with its numbers. Um, but again, it is mostly about portability and power efficiency. So you can see the difference in size. Because this ASIC is so small, uh, it allows for a much broader uh, adoption in like medical fields in places where fast genome analysis would be very helpful. So like if we had to have a GACT ASIC, it, the processor itself isn't too big, but it's built into like rather big machines. It's extremely expensive. Or using like the standard implementations on an AMD EPIC processor or a NVIDIA GeForce 360. These are extremely expensive implementations. And what they designed is a small portable and I also believe rather in a, an expensive solution that would allow for very broad adoption in the medical field. Okay, then I'll continue with the discussion. So I talked about the read length limit of 10,000 base pairs um, and how it simply does not handle these uh, longer reads. So I want to ask you if you have any idea how we could handle reads longer than that. Yeah, that's basically it. How could we handle reads that are longer than these 10,000 base pairs? Yeah. Uh, could you repeat for me, like, where is the, uh, where is there this limit actually, or the about that? Um, they also actually are. Yeah, I'll repeat for the microphone. Uh, yes, why there is this limit of these ten thousand base pairs? Um, it actually isn't talked about that much in the paper, and it's also going to be my next discussion question. So I'm not going to talk about it right now. But so I guess. Uh, like a strategy as in the first uh, as in the first presentation, mm -hmm. right? You want to perhaps uh, split this work into many tasks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, as I said in the previous uh, talk, splitting up these long base pairs could be a possible solution, but 
I also believe that like there's uh, an upside to longer reads. It enables like uh, easier or better alignment. So if we split up these base pairs, we basically diminish the upside of having longer reads. Any other idea? Uh, if not, I also have a little uh, answer provided. So uh, simple CPU offloading. So if you have two large base uh, pairs, two large reads, we could offload some of that onto the CPU. Uh, it has also been done before, but this is basically just a Band-Aid solution. So, oh, we don't have uh, enough capacity to calculate longer base pairs, we'll just do it in software. So this is just a Band-Aid solution, not like a real solution that solves the problem. Also, yeah, splitting up longer reads, but this that basically destroys the benefit of having this long read if we split it up into many smaller reads. Now, your question, uh, why do you think these limits on error rates and read length even exist? Yeah. So I don't know. I think perhaps there's a problem of uh, memory limits that you don't have enough to store more than that. Um, yeah, that was yeah. my first guess. I don't know. <laughs> so his answer was uh, a limit on basically storage. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, like one part, like longer reads require much longer and much larger memory. Um, also on the error rate, they did not explicitly talk about this in the paper, but it's about the efficiency of the algorithm. So standard dynamic programming algorithms, their efficiency is based on like the length of the sequence squared. So in O of N squared and the efficiency or the speed of the wavefront alignment algorithm is in O of the length of the sequence times the error rate or the error score. And how their error score is calculated <laughs> at 10% error score, you actually reach the, about the same number that their maximum read length is. So at 10% error score in the worst case, you basically reach O of N squared. So from then on out, wouldn't make much sense to use this implementation. Okay, um, if there aren't any more questions, I would be done with my paper. I have a few extra slides with like more in depth on the wavefront alignment algorithm if you're interested, but uh, else I would be done. Thank you for listening. Hey then, I think we are done and see you all next week. Yeah, I think what?